I'm gonna sit here in shock for just a minute and just thank God. You need to sprint for your life. God, God, yes, Lord. Come on. Listen, I'm gonna tell you right now, you don't like somebody that's super excited when the Lord of Lords is speaking or when the Holy Spirit is speaking. This is not for you. I'm somebody that freaks out every single time the Holy Spirit reveals something. Listen, listen, listen. I'm, I think I'm done. Cause Hello, welcome back to Talks with Tally. My name is Tally. Welcome if you've never been here before. This segment of my channel, Talks with Tally, is a part of my channel, Time with Tally. But this segment, this podcast, whatever it is that you want to call it, this is where I specifically set out time to speak about the word that the Lord has placed on my heart for you guys, or that he has shared with me that I feel like now probably should be shared to somebody else. I'm very excited to share with you guys the message of today, and I'm not going to lie. It's going to be a tough one. So suit up and wear the full armor of God today because this word will be exposing some truths. Glory to God. All right, let's start with a prayer really quick and then we'll get right into it. Father God, I come to you in this moment, Lord, presenting myself as your child, Lord, asking you that you please be the one, Lord, that is revealing to us the message and the revelation that it is that you want to give us today in this moment, Lord. I ask you, Father God, that it be you speaking. Use your Holy Spirit in this moment, Lord, to fill this place with abundance, with revelation, with a message as individual for each person across this screen and under the sound of my voice in this moment, Father God. I ask that it be you, Lord God, speaking, teaching and doing the works that need to be done in our hearts. Let it be you, Lord God, giving us each an encounter with you individually, Lord, that's undeniable and unshakable, Father. Let it be you showing us who you really are. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen, amen. I, I don't even wanna waste any time because I'm gonna be very honest with you guys. This word I actually recorded a couple days ago. And you don't want to know what happened? The enemy, which is a liar, Señor lo reprenda en el nombre de Jesús, will we rebuke in Jesus' mighty name, decided, right? And I'm going to say that's what happened because that's exactly how I felt. I had recorded the message and I basically had finished the message. I had literally maybe a paragraph left, an hour of recording, when out of nowhere, when I hadn't even touched the microphone or the camera, somehow the microphone was turned off. Mm. And the message was silenced. Well, I'm here today to remind you that the word of God is not to be silenced. And if it is a truth that he wants people to hear, it will come to fruition regardless. So yes, estoy un poquito brava hoy, pero en el espíritu, which means I'm a little bit aggressive today. I'm a little authoritative today, but it's in the spirit because today we are going to be exposing the lies of the enemy. The message is titled a fan and the author. Lord! I'm hype, y'all, I'm gonna be honest. Because I gotta be honest with you, the Lord has been obviously working on my character since I have given my life to Christ. And before me finding out that the message was actually deleted, probably would have insinuated a different reaction, but all I could do was laugh. Because you know what I believe? That the Holy Spirit was revealing, in that message was revealing crazy things to me that I had never even spoken of. And if you were to see the actual video, I genuinely was in awe. I was in shock. I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with my body. I couldn't deal with the Holy Spirit the way that he poured in that moment. But I truly believe as a daughter, as a child of God in this moment, Lord, I come before you, Father God, with faith, knowing, declaring that the revelations will be greater than the last. This is episode five, y'all. This message honestly was constructed a little differently when the Holy Spirit was kind of revealing it to me. Sometimes he will give me just lists and bullet points of things, reveal to me things where it's just like, boom, 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 write this down and then look up the context, look up this and da, 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 da. And then he'll give revelation to surround it. This one in general, ooh, it's a list. It's a number of accounts in which we see what I'm about to speak about. Glory to God. Let's begin in Genesis 50, verse 20. I have the new international version. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Today, you are to be reminded what is the difference between a fan and a follower. Ooh. Today, you are reminded that everything that the enemy has planned and plotted for bad against you, for negative against you, the Lord 
comes in and turns it for good. For one, his word says so, but also where the Lord inhabits, the enemy cannot stand. Jesus, listen, I feel his presence. Y'all ever feel like the Lord gets angry, but in a way it's like, okay, you wanna go, let's go. I feel bad for the one that messes with the Lord. A fan and a follower is not the same thing. A fan is defined as an enthusiastic devotee as of sport or a performing art, usually as a spectator, an ardent admirer or enthusiast, as of a celebrity or a pursuit. A follower is one in service of another, the retainer. Ooh, let's retain his word, yes. One that follows the opinions or teachings of another one that imitates another. I'm here to remind you that the Lord is the author and that the enemy is the fan. Today, we remind you to not be deceived and remind you once again, because I'll probably say it a couple of times, what the enemy has planned for your destruction, for your downfall, the Lord turns it for good. Matthew 4, Verses one through 11, I have to read the story because it's a powerful one. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, therefore it is certain. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you. He said, if you will bow down and worship me, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. I said this actually in the first video that was recorded because it's almost as if the employee is trying to bargain and bribe the owner. He's telling Jesus he can He's telling Jesus that he can give Jesus all the kingdoms with all their splendor, as if the Lord himself did not allow the enemy to have that. Literally like the employee coming to the owner, hey, I'll give you all this if you bow down to me, if you do this for me. I gave that to you in the first place. Jesus was no punk. The Holy Spirit came and led Jesus into the wilderness, right? So this was all orchestrated, this was planned. This needed to happen. But then on top of that, it occurs when Jesus is likely to be the most vulnerable. After 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, he was hungry, it says. Doesn't the enemy love to kick us when we're already down? Lord, when we're most vulnerable, when he thinks that we will break the easiest. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, if. That word is filled with uncertainty. And then Jesus came to him and said, be careful because his word is written, therefore it is certain, it is done. I need you to note something here. It says that the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Be careful those that make themselves high in the place of the Lord. Lord, that was not in my notes. Heard you, heard you, glory to God. He also took him to a very high mountain. I need you to notice how the enemy decided to bring him to very high places. Jesus, when he tries to bring you down, he will make you feel like you're at your highest, like you're unable to be touched. God, like nothing bad will ever happen to you. And notice how he is brought very high. This to me was revealed to be a symbol of how the Lord wants us. The enemy will place us in positions the Lord rebuke him in Jesus' mighty name in positions where we feel we are at our highest and therefore also at our highest point of elevation we are where we are closest to God. He likes to lie, utilizing also the things of the Lord. Do you see what's going on here? Where the Lord intends you to be is high, is to be elevated, is to be closer to him. Yet when the enemy comes in, he wants you to believe that that's where you are. You're at the highest point where you can reach and that's where most people get comfortable and they sleep. And without them knowing that is where they are the most vulnerable. And it's just so interesting to me the way that he always means to bring us down. He always means 
for us to fall. He knows how to make you feel high just to make sure that he can bring you to your lowest low. It's really funny to me because in this moment, in this part of the word, it really is the fan of the book questioning the author. God, that's the plan of the enemy now. This is why you need to be astute, his word says, because the enemy will also lie with the word. You don't think that false prophets utilize the word? Be on alert. I am in no way, shape or means anything near close to what God is obviously, but I am an author. I did write a book, an actual book. And I'm only saying this to say, every square millimeter of this book I chose, I picked the beginning and the end. I know the beginning and the end. I know the intent. I know the context. So no matter what person, what fan may try to come up to me, not that I have fans, just saying, no matter who may come to me saying that they read this book, can come to me and tell me my purpose with it, my intent with it, the meaning of it, and manipulate it against me. And that's exactly what we'll be seeing nowadays. A word misconstrued from the truth. And because there's been so much of that, nobody actually wants to believe in the real truth because it's covered up in so many lies. That was not in my notes. Holy Spirit, glory to you, Father God, always. The word of God is the sword. The word of God cuts through all the lies of the enemy. When you're questioning yourself, your capabilities, when you're, when you're questioning your being chosen, when you're questioning your calling, when you're questioning if God loves you, his word cuts through every single lie. In Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 of the armor of God, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He didn't say part of it. Holy Spirit, not in my notes. I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit speak today. Glory to you, Father God. He didn't say, put on part of it. He didn't say, just pray. He didn't say, just fast. He didn't say, just worship. It's all of the above. The full armor, not the partial, not the in the middle, because you are either in or you're out. You're either hot or cold because the lukewarm he will spit out. Lord, Caleb okay, just keep saying the crazy stuff. Lord, amen, 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 amen. Glory to you, Father. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Lord, it says, take your stand. Stand on a firm foundation of Jesus. Stand, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. How do I say this, Father God? Okay, 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 okay. When you're standing, you are in the closest position to get into a fighting stance. Well, that also, I feel the Holy Spirit. Lord God, amen, amen. Okay, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Therefore, our struggles are not against each other. It is not against people. It is not against another human being. It is against the spiritual forces of evil. So therefore put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, not if it comes, but when it comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, understand that he is saying stand for a reason and he said it three times already. Stand up. Lord, this is gonna, glory to you, Father God. I feel like you're speaking to somebody right now. Stand up. Don't let the enemy laugh in your face. Get up. You're letting him win. Señor, lo reprendan en nombre de Jesús. Get up. Because what God has for you is greater and you can't do it where you're stuck at. God. And notice how it says after you've done everything to stand. That doesn't mean that we may not fall. That doesn't mean that we aren't going to go through trials and tribulations. That doesn't mean that there won't be hard points in this journey. That doesn't mean that there won't be moments where maybe, you know what, we can't stand. But after everything, stand. God, stand firm then. Again, a fourth time, Lord. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. This is something that the Lord revealed to me the last time I was actually recording this. I almost panicked. I was having a whole panic attack. Listen, I need you to understand something. When I was reading in the, when I had gotten this revelation, something struck out to me about the waist belt, correct? That right there is the waist belt. 
right there. In biblical times, the men's tunics and what they wore, it was two pieces. It was the top part and the bottom part. And then what would hold things together was the waist belt, okay? Listen to this. When men needed freedom to work for running or fighting, I added that, but amen. They lifted the hem of the tunic and tucked it into the girdle, same thing as the waist belt, to gain greater freedom of movement. It was called girding up the loins. And the phrase became, listen to this, glory to God, a metaphor for preparedness. Peter, for example, commends clear thinking by advising Christians to gird up the loins of their minds. And this is why it's so important to note what is it that's being protected by the armor of God. It says, carry the belt of truth. Have the word prepared at all times. Submit yourself into the word. So therefore, when you can't push the enemy away or fight back the enemy with one single Bible verse, you have it locked and loaded, ready to go numerous rounds. With the breastplate of righteousness in place, therefore righteousness belongs in your heart. Let righteousness cover your vital organs. Let you breathe in through your lungs and breathe out righteousness, Lord. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you will extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It doesn't mean that the arrows won't hit the shield. It just means that when they actually arrive, that they will be extinguished and have no effect on you. Are you understanding what the word of God is saying today? Lord, I feel like this is a prophetic word for someone. Lord God, speak today. But my friend Lily has a saying where it's like, the enemy has not one original thought not one original idea or bone in this body. Flames usually tend to signify and or represent to us the Holy Spirit. Yet he, in attempts to put us out, attacks us with arrows of flame. I wonder which fire is greater. You know what? Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of salvation, therefore, cover your mind with him with his salvation and remember, do not forget what he did for you, what your salvation means, what did it cost? And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. You need to know the word of God in order to eliminate any confusion. The word of God slams shut any cracked open door. In the word, it says that when a demon leaves a place, he will try to come back to that same place and make sure that the doors are closed, locked up well, secured and covered by the blood of the lamb in Jesus mighty name. And you are sustained, overfilled with his spirit and his word and his promise. Because when you have God's promise, it will subdue and overrule any lie that the enemy can throw at you. Today, I feel that the Holy Spirit wants to remind you that there's no coincidences in the Lord. He is consistent, as is his word. And in case you don't know, there are some people that don't know, there are over 63,770 cross-references, congruencies and consistencies within the word of God, written by 40 people over the course of 1,500 years. These people did not know each other. They didn't copy and paste anything. This was straight revelation from the Lord and what they had seen. Eyewitness statements. Not one man could do that. There's a reason that humans have made up the game of telephone. It's a dangerous game. And it's because everybody knows that at some point, everything ends with a lie when done by humans. So since our God is the one that created this word that's so perfect, what makes you think that he made a mistake in choosing you? Or does our God make mistakes? Absolutely not, as Paul would say. <laughs> this word is sitting here to remind you of the counterfeit. Beware of the counterfeit. A part of my testimony that I speak about a lot is, when I had my seasons of disbelief, I would be in and out intermittently believing, intermittently being deceived and doubting. I believed in a moment of, in the counterfeit gods and counterfeit temporary happiness, counterfeat truth, where I would believe in inanimate objects and cards and crystals and things like that as if they were able to tell me the future and they don't have life. And the only one that knows the future is God. So therefore, if he reveals it to anybody, it's going to be one of his chosen to do so. Listen, I don't want you guys to get it twisted. At one point, I thought maybe like angel numbers were a thing or astrology. That's not God though. The Lord utilized those things in the scripture as tools to send messages. 
and give direction to his people, but that's not God. And that is where the greatest transgression can occur. I would hear in like the tarot videos and things like that, take what resonates for your situation. Listen, let me tell you something. I know a God that speaks directly to people specifically about their situation with no coincidences, with no contradictions. Even when we don't wanna hear it, he's gonna tell you the truth about yourself. And that life of being in or out, that life of having intermittent belief, that was the easy path because nobody, whoever said that it would be easy to live a life with God, it's not easy but it's a thousand percent worth it. This word is here to remind you that everything that the enemy has utilized to wound you, the Lord has now made it your weapon. Lord, I need to tell you guys something about my testimony as well that a lot of people really don't know. Before, nobody, nobody really knew that I had issues with my sleep. The enemy would attack me in my sleep. I would see very ugly, dark, disgusting, vile, in those moments, scary things. Scary because I didn't have God with me, but they were very real. I would get attacked in my sleep. I was an insomniac. I would see, feel things, lift up off my bed in my sleep. Call me crazy, call me whatever you want. But you know what's really funny to me is how people from all over the world will say that they have had an encounter with the Lord, that they have had an encounter with the spiritual realm, and people will still doubt and negate thousands of people. So I guess, you know what? I guess we're all just crazy then. I guess we're all just lying and I guess we're all just making it up. And there's absolutely a scientific excuse and reason as to why these things are happening. Of course, it has to be some type of chemical imbalance. My chemical imbalances make me lift off of my bed. My chemical imbalances make me physically feel things all over my body as if they're actually touching me. Don't get scared now, don't get uncomfortable. I'm gonna stop talking about it now, but this is real life stuff. This is stuff that people don't even wanna talk about. But I'm telling you right now that when you have God going before you, in you, all around you, surrounding you with his angels, there is nothing to fear. There is no room to cultivate an environment of fear. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And it's so funny to me because I would have issues with my sleep, right? I would be up all night being terrorized. How funny is it now that now I stay up all night in fervent prayer, in fasting, getting dreams and visions from God, the Lord revealing prophetic messages, some of true revelation that some may not want to hear, some of abundance though, and happiness and peace, all of it, truth. I get to encounter God now in the middle of the night when in the middle of the night, what the enemy means for my bad, for my downfall, for my pain, for my hurt, for my torment, God has turned it to good. This word, I feel like the Lord literally just gave it to me and it was literally just bullet points, like boom, 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 boom. I'm just going to list off accounts where in the word, the enemy has taken an original idea from the Lord and tried to make it his own and yet has still not had the victory. Jesus' hands had wounds. His hands are weapons. When he placed his hands, miracles happen. When he placed his hands, unclean spirits gotta go. When he placed his hands, the chains are broken. When he placed his hands, everything in your life changes. In the Bible, it speaks of two different lions. There's one of the tribe of Judah, which is known as Jesus. In Revelation 5.5, 5, it says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. It's a fixed fight because the Lord has already won. It's already been done, y'all. How much fear would you have stepping into a ring knowing that actually the fight is already fixed in your favor? Not only that, though, then let's take a peek. In the word, it also says, The enemy is also described as a lion. He looks to destroy while Jesus looks to protect his sheep. 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, like a lion. It's a simile, therefore he is not. He attempts to be a lion. Anybody heard of that saying, the dog's bark is worse than their bite? Therefore his roar has nothing compared to our Lord. One word out of the mouth of the Lord and numerous lions' mouths can be shut. God! God, yes, Lord. Y'all know Daniel was in that lion's den. He was surrounded by lions. 
Come on. So just know to call upon the Lord and ask him to shut the mouth of the lion when he be lying. Come on. He can. And note that he's also not omnipresent like God. So if he's roaming around spectating you like a fan, he's a fan of God's work. And if you're a follower of the Lord, retaining his word, God, notice that because he's not omnipresent, he can't be around in multiple places all at once, but our Lord can. So if the enemy's eyes are on you as much as they are, imagine the Lord's. You know what? I'm done. I think I'm, I think I'm done for today. I'm, I think I'm done. Cause <laughs> we all know what lions represent. Lions usually represent a king. Everybody want to be a king, but nobody want to act like one. Over and over and over, we see the same plan, the same tactics from the enemy are being utilized literally over and over. They're recycled. Over and over, he attempts to be like the king of kings. When the word speaks of shadows, the shadow of death in Psalm 23, four through six. This is the KJV version. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Let me just remind you, oil is placed on someone and is anointed on somebody in order to prepare them to be utilized by God, to be covered in order for God to use them. Preparedness. Ooh, and thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. When God is going to give you justice, he will do it in front of your enemies. Lord, oh my God. So I need you to remember that although you may be surrounded by darkness, although you may be surrounded by depression, the shadow of death, even though people may think that you are a result of your environment, stay rooted in him. For not only does he have his rod, his authority over everything in this world, but he also has his staff to guide you as do pastors of sheep. Not only this, he covers you in his shadow. The word references the shadow of the Almighty. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91, 1, dwelling signifies protection, a shelter of protection, Lord. Note this as well. It's the way that Peter followed in his footsteps. I also really quick just need to come on here really quick and say that this message is not to glorify the enemy in any way. We rebuke him in Jesus' mighty name. We bind and cast him out in any plans against us from him. We cast out in Jesus' name. Listen, the only reason this word is being brought about is to expose a truth that people need to know, that they need to understand. Because when you get into a war zone, when you get into a fight, how are you going to fight something if you don't know how to fight it? If you don't know how to discern it and understand who is your enemy and how does he show up? So let's also note the fact that Peter, that his shadow healed people. He followed him as a disciple, as a person, as a physical being. He followed where the spirit of the Lord led him. And then he followed him so much so in his teachings, in his path, in his character. He imitated him like a follower of Christ. So much so that God then turned his shadow to be one of healing. What the enemy meant for evil, the Lord turns it to good. It says so in Acts 5, 12 to 16, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns from around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Do we not understand that the plan of the enemy in today's world right now is to distort God's plans? Everything has become an opposite now. In so many ways we see it, but let me also note, because the Lord had me praying about this the other day, marriages, families, the Lord is huge on family and covenant and unity, yet nowadays they're just getting torn apart and separated. And you know why? Because God has been eliminated from everywhere. If you don't really know God and his love, which is the ultimate love, do you really know how to love each other in a way that he would want you to love each other? Uniformity, it creates clarity. 
and clarity provides vision. And with a blurred vision, we cannot see the truth. Jesus had to die on a tree. He brought death onto a tree, which symbolizes life in the word to undo what Eve did at the tree of knowledge and life, which is what the enemy had begun. When he brought upon Adam and Eve death and sin, Jesus had to undo it. What the enemy means for evil, the Lord turns it to good. He meant for us to have death and sin. Yet Jesus then said, now I will be the perfect sacrifice, the one without sin. The death of a sinless person undid the sin of generations. When the enemy thought he had won by bringing us death and by seeing the Lord die on the cross, he didn't realize that when Jesus said to Judas, do what you're gonna do, it's because Jesus was saying, make it quick because the quicker I get on that tree, on that cross to be hung, the quicker the victory. He came to undo everything and be the counterculture for everything that we're being taught nowadays. Acts 10 verse 39, it says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. It's so true because I, I watched this uh, young preacher. I don't even know, honestly, uh, his last name. He said, the enemy shows you little bursts of what you think life is, right? Little bursts of life that ultimately lead you to death. But a walk with Jesus causes little deaths to you, a little death to your flesh, to then in turn give you eternal life with him in heaven. Are we not seeing how they are opposites and how Jesus undoes everything that the enemy means for evil? Romans 5, 15 to 17, it says, but the gift, listen to this verse. This verse is crazy. It literally is the summing up of this entire word. It says, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? It took one man to ruin everything and it took another to make it all right. Lord, this is so good. Okay, I'm, I'm actually gonna keep reading 18 to 21. It says, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also right, one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through jesus christ our lord there are numerous passages in the bible and titles of the words that show us this to just in the titles themselves these are just some of the headlines that say from slave of sin to slave of god from groans to glory death through adam and life through christ sorrow turned to joy another account guys listen Clouds and rainbows are signified to be God's promise in the Bible. Genesis 9, 12 to 17, it says, And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. Yes, I read fast. I'm sorry. Clouds and rainbows are the Lord's promise to never destroy the earth again with water. Do y'all know what clouds are made up of? Clouds are made up of pent up water. He's holding it up there as a promise to remind us of his word and that he's a man of his word. The enemy has a counterfeit to this. And we're not even gonna get into the rainbow because you already know, I didn't even gotta go there. Tell me not that the enemy also presents clouds in your storm. The enemy may try to trick you with what God has promised if the Lord has made it clear. 
and made it public. Because listen, when you pray between you and God and it's just in your head, he can't hear you. So if there's something that you want to keep just between you and God, keep your mouth closed about it. I'm not saying don't pray out loud. I'm saying that there's, if there's something that you want to keep between you and God and make sure that the enemy can't use it against you. Keep that in your head between you and God because only God can hear those thoughts. I saw this word one time on Instagram that also it reminded me of this. I think it was Ashley and Ali Yost, these two Christian influencers. They said, the enemy will send you a counterfeit before the real thing that God has for you. Don't get deceived and don't jump on the first opportunity that you see that you think is God's plan for you, promise for you. Be careful. Ask for discernment. Ask for confirmation from the Lord. The same water in the Sea of Galilee, right, that is then became the Sea of Tiberias is the same place where Simon Peter sunk when he looked away from the Lord and took his gaze off of God. And that's why he started to sink as he was walking on water towards Jesus. In that same water is the same water that he was fishing in after the resurrection of Christ, when Christ came to meet him and the other disciples in order to get him his redemption and his restoration. When Jesus resurrected, he said, grab the disciples and Peter. Jesus re-upped Simon. Simon also died on a cross. But he said that he was not worthy enough to die like his master. So instead, they hung him upside down. God said, deny me three times and I will restore you three times. So then in the end, when Christ came back and he talked to Peter to redeem him after he had denied Jesus and knowing him, even though he denied him three times, he got him by a charcoal fire again, the same way that he did when he actually denied him. And he said, follow me three times. He reinstated Peter. Lord. It says, so in John 21, 15 to 19, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon said to John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Imagine being able to trust somebody to feed your lambs. Oh my gosh. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31, it says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the earth to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen it says, and no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Beware of the counterfeit. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12, it says the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all the sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wick wickedness. Understand that there will be false prophets in this time. They know the word, but they intertwine their own teachings within them. They were own misguidances and lies and they subconsciously unweave everything that you know and have been taught by scripture. And that's why we must pray and have a relationship with the Lord and have discernment and, and know it, know the scriptures. And that way you will know that if it doesn't go according to scripture, it doesn't come from God. Jeremiah 23, 21, it says, I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. Matthew 13, 27 to 30, the owner's servants came to him and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. This is the good and the bad people right now. Verse 30 says, let them both grow until 
until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This is symbolic for the fact that among us will be those teaching of God's word. Some according to how it was supposed to be, but then some will also grow with lies. That's why so many people are going to be one way or the other. There isn't an in the middle. I saw a video of a man saying that the many churches nowadays will be closing for two different reasons. One, they are not his. They are not the Lord's. They are not teaching his word. And two, they can't hold what's to come. So in order for the Lord to save them from that, it is better to not have the church. Sometimes it is better for the Lord to get you out of a situation sooner rather than later because the repercussions and the scarring and the trauma of what may occur, the destruction of what may occur may actually have a lasting effect that he does not want. So although we may not understand it, if he says so, it's always for your betterment. If we don't begin to start speaking a truth, exposing the truth, regardless of people's feelings, how are people going to be able to tell the difference between us, between the ones that speak the truth and between the ones that speak the rainbows and unicorns and fluffiness, the words that always stroke your ego and the feelings that make you feel good and comfortable. If that's all you're getting, run. That's my two pieces of advice. If you're always hearing a bunch of fluff and stroking your ego and making you feel good and all these talks always about all this overflow and abundance and new cars, new houses, new businesses, I'm not saying that the Lord does not not do these things. Do not mistake the words that are coming out of my mouth. But if the word is remaining you in a space and in the spirit of comfort, run for your life. If everything is coming so easy, there is a problem too. If it is eliminating or contradicting or going against God's word and or his name or the name of Jesus, and it's focusing way too much on self, self-indulgence, self-empowerment, your power and your capabilities that you can do everything. I'm able to do this. I'm able to do that. And yet you don't hear the name of God either going before or following that and being the causality of that and being the source for every single thing that you do. You need to sprint for your life. They are filtering out his name. Everywhere we go, they are filtering out the name of Jesus. Lastly, I remind you one more time, don't be afraid to expose the counterfeit. According to the scripture of God, don't be deceived. And remember lastly that everything that the enemy has made and plotted against you for evil, the Lord always turns to good. Bless you, Lord. Bless your name, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for moving today. Wow, 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 wow. I need a minute. <laughs> God is crazy, y'all. I just can't even... <laughs> Anyways, let's pray. Father God, I come before you, Lord, as your daughter. I want to say thank you so much, Lord, for the word that you have imparted in my heart, Lord God, to share to others. Lord, in this moment, I have to extend and glorify, elevate, and exalt your name, Father God. Give you all the glory, Lord, because in this moment, I know that you spoke, your Holy Spirit was present, and that within itself is a miracle and grace and mercy. In order to allow me to even be a witness to this, Lord, I am so thankful and so grateful, Father God. I ask in this moment, Lord God, that if it is you speaking to the person across the screen under the sound of my voice in this moment, Lord, that it be you touching them, Lord God, filling them with your Holy Spirit, having them encounter you in a way that's special, that's undeniable, that's unshakable, that they cannot turn their back from, Lord. I ask that in this moment, Lord God, that you keep them safe, Lord, and that they find their way to you, the one true only God that turns everything meant for evil to good. Thank you, Lord, for the word that you have imparted today. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the revelation, Lord. Thank you for not stroking our egos and letting us know exactly what it is that you want us to know, Father God, because we all know that it's for our betterment through you, our Father who loves us so dearly. Thank you, Lord God. Amen and amen. Glory to God always above all else. The glory is always his. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Guys, thank you all for spending time with me and I'm gonna see y'all in the next one. Bye.